So we are talking about compounds, and before I even say anything about the two different categories of compounds, I would like to remind you what a compound is. A compound is a pure substance, and compounds have more than one type of atom. And one of the ways that I described that to you, for example, on that first quiz that wasn't a quiz, was I said that uh, you, there is more than one type of nucleus. Because what's in the nucleus, specifically the number of protons, will identify to you which atom you have. And so all of our discussion is going to surround compounds, things that are made up of more than one type of atom, so that we can discuss how those atoms go together. Now we'll start with ionic compounds. So on my screen, that will be over here on the left. Now ionic compounds, if I were to be able to look at the structure of an ionic compound sort of at the molecular level, I have a couple of illustrations here to show you what an ionic compound is like. Now, if you would like to draw them, you're welcome to. I don't think that you need to draw the entire picture uh, because it's very repetitive. But I'm just going to explain to you what those three illustrations are trying to show about an ionic compound. First things first, an ion ic compound has the word ion in it. That means it is made out of ions and we know there are two types, cations, anions, and we know that one of them is positive and one of them is negative. So earlier today when I asked you what do you know about ionic and molecular compounds? And one of the responses was, well, an ionic compound is made out of a metal and a non-metal. That's true most of the time. But if I was to be a little bit more specific, I would say that it's always made out of a cation and an anion. Now, I know that metals make cations and non-metals make anions. So saying that is not incorrect, it's just not quite the whole story. Now what I'd like to illustrate to you first is what's actually happening in an ionic compound. In the first little picture, this little ball and stick model, what I'm trying to represent are two different types of ions. Let's say just for fun, Oops, what's that? That the red ones are positive and the white ones are negative. Honestly, it does not matter which one we say is which. It's just a little graphic representation. What I'm trying to show you is that in an ionic compound, positive and negatives sort of line up beside each other. Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and in all directions. So notice how this is really a 3D structure. Any one positive ion would be attracted to things above it, below it, beside it, in any direction. And so, realistically, there could be six directions, up, down, left, right, front, back. I could be attracted to a negative ion in any of those directions, uh, and that's how most of the ions in an ionic compound would be. So, of course, these ones that are on the edge don't have something all around them. But think about maybe this little guy in the middle. He's got a positive thing above, below, left and right, front and back. So, in an ionic compound, we're always lining up. Positive, negative, positive, negative. And the reason for this is that each of these little lines, so any of these little lines here, I'm going to pick this one down here are trying to represent an ionic bond. Now, an ionic bond isn't an actual physical thing. It's not a piece. I couldn't touch it. What an ionic bond is, is the electrostatic attraction between something that is positive positive 
and something that is negative. So when I have two oppositely charged ions, the way that they stay together isn't because there's a physical piece. There's not a piece of string holding them together. They're not both touching the same structure. But since they're oppositely charged, there is an electrostatic attraction. Positive and negative are attracted one to the other. Now, since I said that an ionic bond isn't an actual physical thing, it's not something you can touch, the picture in B is a little more representative of what it would look like. In B, I have the same idea, positives and negatives. But if you look, they're just a little bit closer together. And we're trying to represent here that an ionic bond doesn't take up a lot of space. In the first model, there was a space so we could see where things were being attracted. But here, we're trying to show that the ions are going to be basically right next to each other. The last photo is trying to illustrate to you that most ionic compounds end up having a crystal-like shape. It might not look like that from far away, but if you were to take an individual little piece of an ionic compound and look at it really closely, ionic compounds generally have a crystal structure. That doesn't mean that they're all super shiny and beautiful. Crystals aren't all uh, twins of diamonds, let's say, but they would all have this typical shape uh, where you have sort of a cube of molecules all put together. So in an ionic compound, you have ions. You have cations and anions. They're attracted to each other because one of them is positive and one of them is negative. That's how you get an ionic bond. An ionic bond isn't a physical thing. It's simply an attraction between two oppositely charged particles. Does anyone have any questions about ionic compounds up to there? So let's talk about what are they made out of. Now, there are four possibilities. I'll call them A, B, C, and D for what an ionic compound can realistically be made out of. Chances are the scenario that you have already been taught is scenario A. An ionic compound is made from a metal and from a non-metal. When this is the case, we would call this a binary ionic compound. Binary makes reference to the number 2. So in a lot of ionic compounds, there are two different ions one metal ion and one non-metal ion. And there's only one atom in each of them. That's why the word binary would be there, because we have two atoms. Now, there's other scenarios that are possible, and it's because all I need, really, is a positive ion and a negative ion. In the first scenario, metals are positive, and non-metals become negative ions. In the second scenario, I could still have a metal, but I could have something different as my negative ion. So my metal would still be my positive ion, but I could have a polyatomic ion as my negative ion. Uh, so I'd like for you to take out your periodic table, and we're just going to take a quick look back at something that's on it. Oh, we don't want to look at the French one. Wait, wait here. What? This is a fun, exciting thing. I'm not totally sure what is happening with my computer here. Does anyone else have one of these new Windows 8 computers? <laughs> 
I don't know what it's doing right now. Oh, there, that's what I want. So at the top of your periodic table, there is this chart with the table of common polyatomic ions. And I just want to point out uh, a little bit about what you see here. If I look at this table, here's the first thing that I'll see. The word poly, I'm talking about many. So ions don't have to be made out of only one atom. They could be made out of several atoms. And this is a short list of some of the ions that are made out of several atoms. So poly means many. Now if you take a look, charges are indicated in the formulas. So you have the chemical formula with a charge right next to it. And what I'd like for you to notice is this, if you haven't already noticed it. Ammonium is a cation. Every single other thing on this list is an anion. Because there are positive and negative polyatomic ions, they could replace a metal or they could replace a nonmetal. Because remember, an ionic compound is simply a compound made out of a positive and a negative ion, but where those came from it doesn't matter. Now, in real life, there are more than one positive polyatomic ion. Uh, on this list, there simply is not. These would be the only ones that I would realistically use because you have them on a chart. So I just wanted to point this out to you so that I can go back to my description of ionic compounds uh, and tell you that scenario B is probably the second most common. And the reason is there are lots of negative polyatomic ions to choose from. Choice C and choice D would be a lot rarer. And that's because in C, if I was going to make a compound out of two polyatomic ions, I still need a positive and a negative. And on your list, the only positive one to choose is that ammonium, that NH4 ion. So you can see how it would be less common to have this scenario because ammonium is the only one you can realistically pick from. Same logic applies to D. If I have a polyatomic ion and a nonmetal, the nonmetal will be the negative part and the polyatomic ion would have to be the positive part. That means it would have to be ammonium from your table. So a lot of the time, it will just be a binary ionic compound, one metal, one nonmetal. But if you have more than two elements in your compound, chances are you have a polyatomic ion there. So that's like the big clue that there's a polyatomic ion. If there are more than two elements, then you very probably have a polyatomic ion. That's if you're certain that you have an ionic compound. And that will become more important later on when we talk about naming them and writing their formulas. But for now, I just wanted to mention that so that you are aware that that's a difference. Does anyone want to ask any questions about what an ionic compound is made out of? So then our next point is to talk about balancing charges. And we'll talk about this again when we talk about writing formulas. But on the surface, I want you to know how these two ions actually go together. In a, pol or in a polyatomic, in an ionic compound, there must be balance between the charges. What that means is that I have to have the same amount of positive and of negative charge. I can't have plus 4 and just minus 2. That won't work. 
I always have to have equal amounts of positive and negative. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to get that awesome crystal structure and have everything line up. The other thing is this word transfer here. Uh, and someone mentioned that a molecular compound shares electrons. This is what an ionic compound does. I showed you some examples previously when we were just drawing ions of how sodium gave an electron to chlorine, and that's how they both became ions. That is what's happening in an ionic compound. One of the species gave some electrons, transferred some electrons to the other. The ionic bond is then formed. And it's formed because there is attraction, like I mentioned before, between positive and negative. Now the last point here, I put on this screen in the beginning because although we haven't discussed names and formulas yet, you might see some of them. And so I just want to mention this point about brackets or parentheses. When you're writing formulas, for substances, and you notice that there are brackets in the formula, that is a clue that you have a polyatomic ion, and that's another clue telling you you probably have an ionic compound. So that would be a trick that you could use. It won't work all the time because not everything has a polyatomic ion, but if you see brackets, probably have an ionic compound. Uh, would anyone like to ask any questions about ionic compounds here? So we will talk next about molecular compounds. And the first thing I have in, is an illustration, and I don't think that you need to copy the whole illustration. I'm going to use it to prove a point that I'm trying to make. We are talking, don't forget, about molecular compounds. Compounds have more than one type of atom. And sometimes people get mixed up, and they'll call something that's actually an element, a compound, because there's more than one atom. And so my illustration has, on the top row, elements, and on the bottom row, compounds. And notice the difference. Even though in all of those elements there's more than one atom, it's the same kind of atom the whole time. For something to be a compound, you have to have more than one type of atom. So I'd like to make a little list for you of elements that have a number in their formula that make it seem like they're compounds, but they're really not. They're still just elements. And to do that, I'm going to write you a little sentence. I have no bright or clever friends stupid people. And this is a little sentence, a little mnemonic device to help you remember all of the elements that have more than one atom in their formula, but only one type. The first letter or sometimes two letters of each word represents an element. So these are the letters that interest us. I'm going to circle them all. And then I'm going to pause. All right. Uh, so what I'll start with then uh, is a check to make sure you all know which elements I'm referring to. I circled letters because those are the letters in the symbol of each element. I represents iodine. H represents hydrogen. N represents nitrogen. BR is bromine, 
O is oxygen, Cl is chlorine, F is fluorine. And then you'll notice I made a little division here because something changes. All of the elements mentioned in the first part of the sentence always have a 2. I2, H2, N2, Br2, O2, Cl2, F2. The two elements at the end in the stupid people section make reference to sulfur and phosphorus. Sulfur always has an 8, phosphorus a 4. Now, although these look like they might be compounds, because there's numbers in them, those are elements, because they only have one type of atom in them. So if I said iodine, I mean I2. And when we talk about writing formulas and names, I'll bring this up again, uh, so that you know which rules to follow. So those are things that are not molecular compounds. They are elements. A molecular compound needs to have more than one type of atom, and I illustrated a few down here, uh, but so you can see, you have to have more than one letter, more than one capital letter. If you don't, it is not a compound. Would anybody like to ask any questions about uh, elements that look like compounds or about that list? Yes. So, uh, all the elements in the we're saying that when they're just an element, there's a number in their formula. Most things on the periodic table, like for example, iron. If I was to write the formula for iron, I would just write Fe. There would be no number, nothing in it. These are the exceptions. These are the things that when I say their name, we infer, we know that there's actually more than one atom there, even though the name doesn't say anything about it. So everything else on the periodic table, if I said the name of that element, there would be one atom of it. But for these ones just specifically, if I said sulfur, I mean S8. I don't just mean S. Does that answer your question? Now the other way I've heard this list referred to is the gens. If I look at that list, here is what I'll see. Hydrogen. Nitro, gen, oxa, gen, and then I will see a bunch of halogens. That only works for the first part. If I was writing the, if I was using gens, S and P aren't really part of that. I would have to add them on afterwards. But the gens are all of the things that have twos. That would be a good way to remember that. So iodine, bromine, chlorine, and fluorine are all halogens. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. That would be another trick you could use to remember the list. Uh, what I'm going to do now is scroll down and talk about what molecular compounds are made from. Now, someone told me already at the beginning of class, they are made from two or more nonmetals. We are going to focus on things that are made out of two nonmetals. That will be our primary discussion. Like I mentioned previously, a compound made from only two elements is called a binary compound. Uh, do compounds exist that are made out of more? Of course. They are just not going to be the topic or the main topic of our discussion. Yes? Um, all of them, probably realistically, no, but you could have a compound with lots of them in it. For example, and I'll just do a quick example here. I wouldn't suggest you write this down because it's more complex than I would need you to know. I can make a molecule with a whole bunch of carbons lined up next to each other. And carbon can attach to a lot of different things. So I can have a molecule that has, say, hydrogen and oxygen and chlorine and bromine. I could have lots, probably not all of them all at the same time, but I could realistically have a compound that had several different nonmetals all part of the same compound. A lot of biological molecules, so like a protein or a carbohydrate, have several kinds of nonmetals. For example, if I was talking about a protein, it has carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, a lot of the time sulfur as well. So that's already five things in one compound. Uh, now, 
maybe most isn't the best word here, but lots. Lots of molecular compounds, the formulas are basically memorized because to name them according to the regular rules of naming would be weird and the name would be really long. So I'm just going to give you some examples. You all know that water is H2O. Now, that's not the scientific way to name water. If I was actually going to name that, uh, I would have to make reference to the fact that there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. Uh, it would be called dihydrogen monoxide. It would be a really long name. And so a lot of molecular compounds have formulas that are memorized. And what that means is that their name doesn't tell you what their formula is like. I'll give you another example here. Uh, Glucose. Glucose is a pretty typical molecule that's discussed in high school chemistry and biology. Glucose is C6H12O6. Nowhere in the word glucose uh, am I instructed to put six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. So the name doesn't actually tell me what's in the formula. And as we go along, I'll mention a few other molecular compounds where you're not going to know how many atoms there are just from looking at the name. Uh, the other idea that's important is that you do not, absolutely not, try to balance charges because it will be impossible. Since molecular compounds are made up only of nonmetals, if I were to look at what kind of charge those things get, they're all negative. There's no way I can balance that out. They all share electrons, and the type of bond that you get is called a covalent bond. Ionic compounds make ionic bonds. Those words kind of go nicely together. A covalent bond. Let's talk about the word. Covalent. Co means the things are doing something together, like cooperating or coordinating. So two things together. Valent, think about the word valence. What we're saying is that these two atoms are going to take their valence electrons and put them together and share them. So I'm going to draw an example here. Being able to draw this is not in the scope of Science 10, but I find that it helps illustrate this more clearly. If I was to draw a molecule of water, oxygen, because it's in family number six, has six valence electrons. Hydrogen, because it's in family number one, has one valence electron. So when I put them together, this is the setup that I would get. Hydrogen is not giving its electron to oxygen. Oxygen is not giving an electron to hydrogen. They are taking their valence electrons and putting them together so that they can share them. This way, hydrogen on either side has two valence electrons, and that is the maximum amount that can fit in its valence electron shell. Oxygen has eight electrons. That is the maximum number that can fit in its valence shell. So the idea with molecular compounds is that they're not going to let their electron leave. They're going to come together and share electrons. The covalent bond is those shared electrons, the fact that both atoms are using that same pair of electrons. Would anybody like to ask any questions about molecular compounds? So this part is what I like to call the theory. This is stuff that you really can't see or touch or check in the lab. The next thing I'd like to do is talk about some macroscopic properties, ones that you could actually observe in a lab setting so that when we do a lab, you know what you're supposed to look for to differentiate between these two. Uh, does anybody need this screen to still be up because they are writing something? <laughs> 
So, uh, the other thing I wanted to do was compare ionic and molecular compounds in terms of their properties. Ionic compounds have high melting points, and I could replace the word melting with boiling and have this still be true. When I say high, uh, I don't mean like 50. 50 is not very high. I mean something like the high hundreds or even a thousand or greater. So there's no one number that I could give you like, okay, after this point, it's definitely ionic because there's always a little bit of overlap. But if you were looking at something's melting point and it was a really high number, like 900, you would say to yourself, hmm, that sounds like an ionic compound. If something had a melting point of 45, you would say to yourself, ooh, that's small. That's probably not an ionic compound. On the ionic side, I've written something, and I've left the molecular side blank because I wanted to show you a way that you could study this. Since they're basically the opposite one of the other, if you know one side of this, you sort of by default would know the other side. A molecular compound should have a low melting or boiling point. Any time that I'm asking you to compare two things, this would be a really logical way to do it. Try to compare the same property and see how they both uh, show that property. And that way you might only have to study one side of things. You, it'll save some room in your brain. Now, ionic compounds generally have a crystal shape. I showed you that earlier. Molecular compounds if they are even solid, are usually very soft. So ionic compounds are crystals. Molecular compounds, if they're solid, are generally kind of soft. There would be an exception to this, very notably, sugar. Sugar kind of looks like it would be an ionic compound. And so that's a good chance for me to tell you that this list is not 100%. Uh, not every single compound will follow these rules, uh, but it's like uh, evidence for chemical change. If you have enough pieces of evidence, you can be pretty certain of your answer. Ionic compounds are soluble in water. Molecular compounds generally are insoluble in water. And it's actually quite key that we stay in water. Water is not the only liquid in the universe that I could dissolve things in. And so it's important that we use water as our reference. For ionic compounds that are soluble in water and thus make a solution, they are conductive. And so it's important that I said conductive in solution. A solid ionic compound, like a crystal of salt, is not going to conduct electricity. It has to be in a solution for it to conduct electricity. Molecular compounds, since most of them don't even form solutions, are generally not conductive. Even a molecular compound that does dissolve in water, like sugar, doesn't conduct electricity in solution. Now, there are a couple of other things that I would like to mention just about ionic compounds. Ionic compounds are solids. They are solids, and I specified at STP. Does anyone know what STP stands for? STP kind of sounds like STD, now that I think about it. <laughs> it's STP. It stands for Standard Temperature and Pressure. What I'm saying is an ionic compound at a normal temperature will be a solid. Of course, if I'm in an incredibly hot environment, it might not be a solid anymore. But when we're talking about regular temperatures, normal temperatures, ionic compounds are solid. The other thing I want to mention that's just about ionic compounds is this. 
most chemical substances are colorless or white. And so their physical appearance in that sense doesn't do anything to dis discriminate them. But if something had a color, if something had a color, it's probably an ionic compound. So for example, there are a bunch of substances uh, that when they are part of an ionic compound give a distinctive color. Copper gives pretty, pretty distinctively this nice blue color to a compound. Other things like manganese uh, give a purple color. Cobalt gives a purplish red color. So some metal ions, and I'll just note this here, some metal ions and even some polyatomic ions have a color. So when we're in the lab next week and I'm asking you, hey, substance A, what kind of a compound is that? And you notice that it's bright, vibrant green, you'll say to yourself, ah, ionic ones were the ones that had colors. That one should be an ionic compound. So color won't always be something you can use because most things are white or colorless. But every once in a while, something has a color and it's probably ionic. I always say probably or generally because none of these things are 100%. Uh, there are some molecular compounds that have a color. For example, I do this demonstration in Chemistry 30 with a gas that's brown. So some other things have colors too. But most of the time, if there's a color, it's ionic. So that could be an extra piece of evidence. So if you have something that's green and it's soluble in water and it conducts, you'll say to yourself, OK, that's three pieces of evidence that thing is definitely ionic. Uh, would anyone like to ask any questions about any of the things that are on the screen there? STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. Uh, it actually makes reference to some specific values. So standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. Uh, standard pressure uh, is 100 kilopascals. I, that's not the numbers that really, I'm just trying to uh, get you to realize that if I was in a really cold environment or a really hot environment, that might not be true. But regular temperature, regular pressure, ionic things are solid. Uh, does anybody else have anything they'd like to ask? Someone this morning asked me, if ionic compounds are solid, what are molecular compounds? And I didn't write anything because there's no set thing. Some of them are gases, some of them are solid, some of them are liquids. The thing that I want you to note, really, is that if you have a really soft solid, not a hard crystal-like one, that could be a differentiating thing. If you have a liquid or a gas, since you know that ionic compounds are solid, if it's a liquid or a gas, well, then you probably have a molecular compound. 